Skylander Swap Force is a... Look, cut the Windows 96 music, we've done this twice already, I don't think we need to go into much history or the standard retrospective bullshit. You want to hear about the funny guys who saved the world. You want history? Here you go. The game came out on October 13th, 2013 on the 3DS, Wii, Wii U, Xbox 360, PS3, Xbox One, and PS4. Enough messing around, I want to jump into this shit, this is a long one. Right off the bat, we've got to talk about the visual upgrade. Spyro's Adventure and Giants were primarily being developed for the Wii, thus ports to other consoles, more powerful consoles, looked weird. Giants looked okay on modern consoles, I think mainly as it was a launch shell for the new HD only console, the Wii U, but Giants was built on top of the Spyro's Adventures engine, who looks absolutely disgusting on non-Wii platforms. It's hard to describe it, it's a lot like Sonic 4 on Xbox 360 compared to the Wii. They look better in a technical sense, but none of the models look updated to fit the new platform, just soaked in nail polish to make them shinier which doesn't equal HD. However, with Swap Force being the first game for the new generation of the systems, mainly the Xbox One and PS4, the developers, who were Vicarious Vision this time instead of Toys for Bob, knew they could not build off the SSA base again. The game looks beautiful. It's in very nice looking HD with very colorful looking worlds. But now that begs the question, how does the Wii version look- JESUS CHRIST! I'll talk about the Wii version of Swap Force and Trap Team when I review Trap Team, but holy sh**, this game was not made for the Wii. Not only does it look terrible, one of the worst looking games on the platform, it just runs piss poor. But I didn't play the Wii version. Add a U and remove 88 million console sales, and there you have the platform I played it on. Alright, level 1, your standard Skylanders intro grass level. Doesn't grab you as much as the Spyro's Adventures burning hellscape, oh god, everyone on this island is dead, but it's okay. Just jump over this platform and defeat some enemies and... Wait a second. You can jump in this game? You're saying, in this beat-em-up, semi-platformer series, it took three games to jump on your own? Ridiculous! In all seriousness, the addition of a jump button really adds to the flow of the game. Platforming is a lot less clunky, and it even helps out with combat, as a good number of enemies you can either jump over their attacks or the enemy themselves. Continuing on, we free some people and find ourselves at the classic Elemental Gate. You have a standard grass one to use Stealth Elf on, but you also have a Fire and Water Gate. Well, we got a Fire type, and we got a Water type in the box. So, I guess you have to have a second player. And that kind of sucks. Wait. Wait, what are you- what are you doing? WHAT THE fuck? Now we can finally get into the swap part of the game's title. You can mix and match any tops or bottoms of any of the 16 swappers, creating 256 possible combinations. This is one of the best gimmicks I've ever seen. I genuinely don't know how this works. It's also smooth, with just a few magnets to snap them all together. This gimmick alone makes Swap Force better than Giants, as at least the gimmick in this game isn't just Skylanders but big. And hey, the Giants do have something to do in this game, don't get me wrong, they have the Giants chest! They're just treasure chests that can only be opened by Giants for no reason other than to justify buying a Giants figure, but they have, they have something to do in this game. This level also introduces challenges you can do with the swappers depending on which bottom you have. There are 8 different challenges, Rocket, Climb, Dig, Bounce, Sneak, Spin, Speed, and Teleport with Mount Cloudbreak having Rocket, Climb, and Dig challenges. Dig is okay, just a slow walk through this underground cavern to dig up three treasures. It's not great, but it works. Rocket is fun. I never get excited to see it, but I never mind playing it. It's enjoyable. Climb is one of the two that I always enjoy playing and actively go out of my way to play. Something about the physics of the climbing wall is very satisfying. Despite being a pretty generic level one, it's a perfect introduction to all of what Swap Force has to offer. Level 2, Cascade Glades, is alright. Pretty much another tutorial level that doesn't hold your hand nearly as much. This level is the first instance of the Bounce, Stealth, and Speed challenges. Speed is very similar to Rocket, minus the fact that you cannot slow down. Some of these challenges get pretty difficult later on, so the lack of slowing down does really hinder this challenge though. So it's being ranked underneath Rocket. Stealth isn't hard, it's just so... So slow. 
slowly walking around this place and whenever you're in the spotlight, press the A button to hide. It's not hard, it's super linear and easy, but I tend to skip this one as it's just boring. And now we have Bounce. I adore Bounce. This is by far my favorite challenge in the entire game. One where I not only go out of my way to play it, I get excited to play it. The top down bouncing is so simple yet so much fun, and the extra jump you can get with the A button allows you to skip so many platforms and it creates a little challenge of your own, trying to see how many platforms you can skip. It reminds me a lot of the Patrick platforming challenges in the Spongebob movie game, which I also love. Level 2? It's alright. Level 3, Mudwater Hollows. Gilman saves this level. His rapid fire dumbass stories are so funny that it makes up for this pretty drab level. Not only is this level not that fun, it doesn't even look good as it's very dark and gross. We also save the first of the four ancients here. The ancients are... Yeah. I feel like they were going for a Spyro's Adventure style elemental spirits but fail because A, they don't correlate at all to where you find them, and B, they're kind of half-heartedly thrown in. Spyro had a perfect setup for the spirits, three to four levels that gradually get more difficult and teach you the general enemies and gimmicks for that section before ending with either a harder level to test your knowledge of the zone or a boss fight that awards you the spirit that matches with the zone you are in. The forest one gives you the life spirit, the fire one gives you the fire, etc. Here, not only do they have a magic fish and a bubble in the grass zone, they also have zero buildup. Going back to SSA for a second, the entire game is just Hugo saying, ooh, I can feel how close we are to the next spirit, while Swap Force has none of the characters even acknowledging the fact that the Ancients exist until they're right in your face. Unless characters are always bringing up how important the Ancients are and how close we are to freeing them, I don't care about them. They also just randomly show up too. Mudwater Hollows is a perfect example of this as it starts off as a regular level with no signs of a big part of the game being freed until the very end. Even then, it's not some badass fight to free him, it's a standard go around and break four things to free him. I can tell they're going for something cool with the Ancients, but the half ass attempt kinda ruins the whole concept. But hey, it's better than Giants... nothing. Oh shit, I forgot to talk about the last two challenges, Teleport and Spin. Teleport is pretty good, it can get pretty tense, but never unfair. I like it. And Spin. Dear lord, I f***ing hate Spin so much. It's so touchy and you bounce everywhere, it's too hard to control, making it too easy to fall off, and if you fall off you have to redo the entire thing all over again. It's the only challenge that I actively avoid and refuse to do. So yeah. The challenges are either some of the best part of the games, or some of the worst part of the games. Chapter 4 is another... another grass stage. We already got the ancient dude, why are we still in the grasslands? Oh, well we have to defeat evil Glumshanks. Idiot. E evil Glumshanks? Why? I love Glumshanks. But why introduce a seemingly new, never before seen threat just to throw him in like that? To answer my own question, tell me if we can get introduced to the concept of evilized creatures. Yes, that was in the last level, shut the hell up. And Chaos's mom. The evilized creatures are okay. I kinda love taking regular things and making them evil, so I'm okay with this. And Chaos's mom is one of my favorite characters. She's not only the funniest, but she always takes over when she's on screen, and I just love it. Anyways, level 4 is pretty good. However, my game did crash here, so. Expects the stone monkey. Because of the crash, however, I did learn about the game's coolest feature. If the power is lost mid-level, it brings you back to the nearest checkpoint, which is an extremely helpful feature and very nice feature as these levels take forever. Holy sh! I cannot describe to you how long these levels take. Wait, yes I can. 50 minutes! 50 minutes is the standard! for this game, with some levels getting to the one hour mark. Compare that to SSA and Giants, SSA's longest level only got to 25 minutes, half of the fastest level in Swap Force, and Giants? Well, I felt like those levels dragged on for eternity, only lasted as long as 45 minutes. That's my biggest issue with this game, it takes forever. 
When levels are good, they're bogged down just a bit by their length. But when levels are bad? Holy shit! This game is a nightmare. Level 5 is the last force level and it's an evil Glumshanks boss fight. It's fine, I guess. It's fun enough. I just don't get why we're still in the forest if we got all we needed to get. Whatever, on to some new scenery in the next chapter. Level 6, Iron Jaw Gulch is the start of the generic desert world. Ugh. I hate desert worlds. They're so drab and boring, and they're all the same, and they're almost always my least favorite part of any game. But you know what? Despite my hatred of desert levels, I really enjoyed this one. It's mainly because you're not in the desert all that much. You're constantly going in and out of houses to get items and play little games to progress, which I love. Sure, the visual monotony of the houses can apply here, but the houses only truly appear a lot in this level, so it's okay. I really love the bouncing on the music notes to open up gates, and this tech 2D platformer section was very enjoyable. Kind of want a Skylanders 2D platformer now. Very solid level for being in a not so solid environment. Level 7, Motleyville. Now, this is the generic, unenjoyable desert I've come to expect. This level is just nothing. I don't remember a single thing about it. It has two boss fights in it, which is kinda cool, but they're both piss easy. One is against Baron Von Zeeks over here, and the other one is Evilized Whiskers. Who is Whiskers? Oh, well she's Tessa's bird that we've been traveling with the whole game, obviously. Oh sh! Tessa! I completely forgot about her! She's boring! She's a Skylanders fangirl who also kind of swoons for Flynn as he's the best pilot in Skylands, but she also doesn't. I, I don't care. Callie, this isn't. Either way, the idea of fighting your evil companion is really cool, but comes up too early for it to be impactful. Level 8, Twisty Tunnels. Fairly alright. This level looks stunning with some beautiful purples on the night sky. This level is also fairly unique as you get to shrink down and go inside evil eyes crystals to destroy them from the inside to free the second ancient. It's pretty good, minus the shooting section that still controls way too slow. And you know what makes it better? Level 9 is the last desert stage, and it's a boss fight. Now why the boss fight didn't come before freeing the ancients, I don't know. But hey, at least it's not a pointless level to pad out the game. It's pretty fun too, with Vor halfway through. Level 10, Bony Islands. Bones? Is this an undead world? I loved those levels in the first game. They were my favorites. Ha! No, it's an ice world, b****. Uh, ice? G generic ice world? And to add insult to injury, the level isn't even good. Oh... Level 11, Winter Keeps is also not that good at all. It's another slow and boring stage where instead of slowly moving blocks to proceed, you slowly dig up snow to proceed. At least the lore of Whirlwind being cool. <laughs> the, the lore of Whirlwind being cool. At least the lore of Whirlwind being some god is pretty cool. I mean, holy shit, mom, new Skylanders lore dropped. Frostfest Mountains is interesting. It does stuff I really should like, plays around with visuals and gimmicks of having a small light on you so you can't see that far ahead, and even gives you more lore with these Slam Bam people and their little mini games that they have. I don't know man, I was so bored this whole level, I hated this one too. The Ice World is not doing itself any favors. Maybe it can end well? And it did! The Mesmeralda boss fight is a ton of fun and gets pretty difficult at points, but never to an unfair degree. Here's where we get the third Ancient. Weird how they decided to put him in the boss fight instead of the level before like all the other ones, but hey, that's what I wanted so I'm not complaining. Alright, level 14, let's see what crazy new level themes they have for the last stretch of the game. Are you fucking kidding me? We're back to the fucking forest? What was the five godforsaken levels not good enough? And to make matters worse, it's extremely similar to levels two and three. This level is another edition of grab the item to progress and get the cannon and use the shitty controls. The level ends by saving less ancient? Huh? We just saved one in the last fucking level! 
You're telling me that this multi-million dollar studio making a game that makes multi-millions of dollars of profit can't make like two more levels in the main stories so as they're not a reusing level ideas and B having half of the main objective of the games back to back. And on top of this shitty, shitty level, you defeat Chaos in a fucking water cannon battle. Yeah, the main guy, yeah, he's already dead. But oh no, Chaos's mom, who hasn't really done much but send out one or two of the bosses and be the best character in this cutscenes, frees Chaos and kidnaps Tessa. Who? I do love this cutscene though, especially this part where Chaos and Patrick Warburton are having this nice little conversation, it's, it's very sweet. Once again you have foiled one of my son's ridiculously overblown and poorly thought out plans. Wow, your mom's kinda harsh, huh? You think? Well, now we gotta do like what, the fourth Chaos Fortress infiltration? Chaos's Fortress is a very good last level. It's both challenging and platforming in combat, and really makes you feel like you're taking Chaos down from the inside out, infiltrating his fortress. See, Swap Force? This is what happens when you remove stupid ass gimmicks and stick to what works. You make a good level. The next level, Motherly Mayhem, is fantastic. It's not only a good fight with throwing all the game's hardest enemies at you and letting you flex your skills against them, but it also has the coolest gimmick of all time that I don't think any other part of the Skylanders franchise has. During the fight, Mother Chaos retreats and hides in your portal, and the only way to get her out is by physically removing the Skylander to find her. That's awesome! What a clever and creative use of the toy select gimmick, making you actually do something with the fact that you have physical toys next to you. I was awestruck during this battle for that concept alone, it's fantastic, and leads right into the last boss of the game, Super Evil Chaos in the Cloud Break Core, and it's... Oh, it's fetish shit. Okay, so we defeat Evil Chaos and save the world, the end. Hold it! You thought we were done? Nah, just like SSA, this game has two additional levels that you can play with their respective level packs. Sheepwreck Island is a very fun, very solid level that doesn't shake things up too much, but has really good level design and an alright boss fight to make up for it. While Tower of Time is also very good, but for the opposite reason, having a fantastic time-stopping gimmick that is hella fun to play around with, while having a not-so-good boss fight at the end. Still, both of these levels are some of my favorites in the whole game, I'm glad that they're here. Well, that's all the levels in Swap Force. Such a mixed bag of a game. Some of my favorite levels in the Skylanders history resides in this game, while some of my least favorite, worst, most boring, most dreadful levels also call this game home. I guess there's only one more thing to do. RANKING TIME! With 32 new Skylanders, 16 Swappers, and 16 Cores, we gotta see who wasted my mom's $15 that she hard earned or the ones that I'll be holding a funeral for when their NFC chip breaks. Let's go. Number and number Scratch and Punk Shot. Yeah, this is the first game where I don't have every figure. Not sure why. With Trap Team above, I get why, because I fell out of Skylanders around that time. But Swap Force? This was the peak of my Skylanders addiction. Punk Shot isn't too hard to find, only going for around 8 bucks or so, but Scratch? <laughs> I'm not paying 40 bones for one Skylander to use in this one video. You, I, I could have gotten an NFC card with them, but I'm, I'm too lazy. Either way, they're going in the negative zone on this list. Number 30, Rubble Rouser. I don't like very much. He's too slow and he's a heavy hitter that doesn't even really hit that hard. His attacks are kind of weak for a swapper. He feels a lot more like a Giants holdover than a Swap Force character. Definitely one of my least favorites. Number 29, Smolder Dash. Mindless button masher. A long range, powerful whip is all she has going for her. Her secondary and primary attacks flip flop between a black hole and a big ball of fire that makes it way too inconsistent to use. And not even really all that good to begin with. Number 28, Zulu. Weird, but not horrible. Just bad. The club attack is actually a range attack that fires projectiles, so Zulu plays more like a range shooter than a melee attacker. 
he's fine, I guess, but he's just not my first choice. Number 27, Countdown. Eh, not my style. Not horrible, I can see the appeal, but the weak range attack with a mini small bomb that you can send out that doesn't really do much either, and an inconsistent physics-based head detach bomb that just doesn't work for me. I can understand why someone may like him, I don't though. Number 26, Hoot Loop. A weird lock-on but also not lock-on shooter with a short range slowdown attack and a hoop teleport attack that leads to one conclusion of this Skylander. Slow as hell. A fine enough moveset on a Skylander that is just a slog to play through. Number 25, Slobbertooth. Slow, not that strong, with a fun moveset. Increase his speed and power, and he would be one of my favorites. Number 24, Rattleshake. Eh. Alright shooter with a good get off me attack, but an okay try attack. Shooters are just not my style in Skylanders. Number 23, Rhino. Generic. Middle of the road character. He has a bike. That's all. Number 22, Trap Shadow. Middle of the road as well. I like the trap aspect, but that's really it. Better than Frino, because at least he has the extra health being a swapper. Number 21, Fire Kraken. Another middle of the road character. Last of the three. I really like his juggling move, secondary, but that's really it. That's the reason why he's the best middle. Number 20, Dunebug. Very situational. On a battlefield with multiple points to push enemies off, he excels as a secondary attack is a sticky ball that catches anything, even if they're spinning or have a shield, and rolls it right off the map for an instant kill. Other than that, his attacks are fairly weak. Number 19, Stink Bomb. Alright, I like the punch move, and the vanish actually makes you unseen by enemies. It's very nice. I like it, he's just okay. Number 18, Wind Up. Very fun attacker with one major downside. Hella fun primary with an even better juggling primary, but after a few attacks, he needs to rewind himself before he can attack again. The rewind isn't that powerful, okay at crowd control, kind of, but if you hit the button too much, you'll spin and lose all the progress you made with the wind. Fun character with just a too big of a downside. Number 17, Star Strike. Another fun attacker with a less big but still decent flaw. I really love her reflector and how it can not only reflect enemy projectiles, but her own projectile she fires to create a bigger projectile. It's a very fun gimmick that gets ruined with a bunch of shield enemies as the shield can break the combo. Her primary attack is also pretty bad with a small radius, static strike down, but it's not the main part of her moveset. So whatever. She's just okay. Number 16, Doomstone. Solid attacker, a little slow, but has a very fun spin attack. Also an interesting shield that reflects enemy attacks and freezes enemies. Pretty solid, just nothing special. Number 15, Riptide. Very similar to Swashbuckler, with a lesser secondary that still isn't bad. A very solid character all around. Number 14, Blast Zone. Good lob with a fun dash and fire spin. Not much to say, I just enjoy using him. Number 13, Bumble Blast. A very strong long range attacker with some weak melee attacks. Bit too slow for my liking. Number 12, Scorp. Good long range attacker with great mobility and a knockback attack that is very fun and a very fun poison mechanic as well. Just a fun character to use all around. Number 11, Free Ranger. A nice three hit melee attack with a projectile at the end, a stun third attack that is very helpful and you have some range to it as well, and a fun whirlwind attack that is just too inconsistent to be helpful. But just a fun character to use still. Number 10, Boom Jet. A fun long range attacker with a fantastic primary, and a fun second secondary, and a bad primary, secondary. So like when you press the button once, that, that attack is really bad, when, when you press the button twice, it's it, that's good. It's confusing. Number 9, Gorilla Drilla. A very strong high DPS melee attacker with an alright ranged tank thingy 
It doesn't do a lot of damage, but it can help out a bit. And a fun monkey rush attack. Very fun overall, just lacks the crowd control which he desperately needs. Number 8, Popthorn. A very strong moveset that changes depending on the inflation rate. Great at both long range attacking and short range attacking makes this one of my favorite cores. Number 7, Magma Charge. Great swapper. Fun throwing move that allows you to throw stuff even if you didn't pick up an enemy to throw at another enemy. A fun shooting attack that is quick and powerful. Even the recharge isn't too terribly bad as it's quick. And a fun dash throw that is alright at crowd control. Very fun and very solid. Number 6, Night Shift. A pretty good melee attacker who is a tank. A bite move that heals him and a free revive allows him to easily cheat death all the time. Very fun mechanics on an already fun Skylander. Number 5, Grim Creeper. An extremely powerful and very fun melee attacker with a very strong single attack and pretty solid crowd control. The disappear move is like a better version of Fright Rider's Bone Drill, as sure it leaves you vulnerable, but when you're ready to use the attack, you move fast out of the armor and snap to the ghost when you're ready. Number 4, Freeze Blade. An alright main attack, but a tremendous freeze attack that is extremely helpful and super fun, and a super speedy dash attack makes Freeze Blade one of my favorites. Number 3, Washbuckler. A very great attacker, very strong sword, a fun shooting attack that freezes enemies in place, and the best move of any Skylanders, the held down secondary. Rapid strikes into a spin makes this move perfect to attack with and to get away with. I love this move, and it makes Swashbuckler one of my favorites. Number 2, Roller Brawl. Amazing on every front. Super speedy, great melee attacks, and a decent range attack, and a fun knockback and speed up attack. One of my favorite Skylanders. Number 1, Spy Rise. Very underrated. I did not realize how much I liked him until making this ranking. Amazing primary, a good getaway secondary, and an amazingly fantastic primary that not only shows enemy health, but also has potential to instant kill. That part's a little inconsistent, but it, it, it happens. And with that, I'm done with this game. Skylander Swap Force is a really good game, but Jesus Christ it drags. I will always have a special place in my heart for this game, as it came out in the peak of my Skylanders obsession. I remember getting this game day one and being so, so excited for it, but playing it critically, it offers some very high highs and some very, very low lows, but I'm so happy to be done because playing the same level 30 times to rank these f***ers killed me. I'm taking a nap, wake me up in like a year for the Trap Team video.